Welcome everyone. Next edition of Reimagine uh, Corporate Innovation Series. I have Zubin and let me just see if I'm going to have a shot at Rustam. Rustam J? Pretty good. Pretty good. Not bad. You have a, have a crack at mine, mine just for the sake of it. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Cruel. <laughs> Don't worry, mate. I'm not the only one they stuff my name up to. <laughs> um, Zubin is from IBM uh, Managing Consultant Cloud Application Innovation at uh, we get, we get to the heavy hitters and I wanted to talk to him uh, specifically, you know, um, we're in, you know, stage four lockdown, Melbourne, um, crazy times. And what I, what I, you know, the premise of this show is that, you know, like we cannot drop innovation, right? We need to think, keep thinking about innovation. I think it's probably more important than ever. And I'm interviewing leaders like yourself to understand what's working and ultimately try and add, you know, um, leave our our viewers with some inspiration there's a lot of people stuck in their heads right now all the uncertainty in the world and um i don't think that the the strategy of let's just wait till it kind of passes and then get back to life as normal is a valuable one and um and you've agreed to join me and, and i thank you for that um can i start with a little bit of um background because you have quite interesting background here zubin um Everything from poly, everything from you know government, um, you know research with big 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 corporates through to this quite a substantial career at IBM. Can you just talk about your background, and how you ended up at IBM, um, sure. running cloud? Well, thanks, Chris. Um, again, appreciate being invited. Love the topic. I think it's it's a fun one, right? Because it really depends on how you want to define it. And I'll touch on what I mean by definitions as we go. But in terms of my background, I studied engineering. So I, studied, I did my bachelor's in mechanical engineering and international business at Swinburne because I wanted to design cars. The dream was going into that degree, Holden car designer, and the rest would be great. Yeah, you, you yep. see, you laugh, right? But that no, was. No, no, well, well, I went to Swinburne. I'm thinking about that. They have incredible labs and like um, yep. set up for engineering, right? That's it. Um, yeah. And two years in, I realized I didn't really particularly care about the, where the dynamics into a piston or a wheel went. Um, I didn't have the same level of passion that, say, a lot of my friends did at the time. So I decided to reevaluate. And problem solving, teamwork, all of the soft skills you learn from an engineering degree led me towards maybe there's something in consulting or maybe there's something in professional problem solving. Um, and I suppose through that time, I also did a lot of volunteering. So I found myself in various places like India doing an engineering project or Germany publishing a, a policy paper, or even just being able to volunteer at a number of different positions. And one of those positions led me into the Department of Premier and Cabinet. So if we look at how I transitioned from an engineering degree into a year of government work, it was purely from me wanting to give back a little bit of time and give my opinion on what was at the time very multicultural, multi-faith style of issues that were affecting young Victorians into what turned out to be a really ex different experience around policy development, recommendation design um, and engagement. Can I, can I stop there, right? Because sure. it's super interesting to me. Um, we just had, um, I'd had, you know, Debbie Millman, um, She's the senior vice president of um, the Sage Foundation, which is which is you know largest one of the largest tech companies in the UK. Um, and you know they had implemented, um, you know, part of their foundation was that all the employees got to volunteer five days a week, and this completely changed the the entire organisation. You know the outlook on employees, right. um, the 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 attraction of of new talent. The retention of talent. Can you just like? I just want to hear a little bit about like how you would you know, um, you know. I was a I was probably a bit of a selfish prick, you know, <laughs> around the time I was going to college. How did you end up like, you know, wanting to wanting to volunteer and, and take that time to, you know, have what was I guess like a self, you know, uh, you know, self discovery um, journey. Sure, sure. <clears throat> Sorry, throat's a little bit scratchy. But it's, so there's the, there's the really good, really motivational reason. And then there's the really honest, really emotional one. Mm -hmm. In terms of the first one, it was 
engineering wasn't enough. And I was realizing that if I kept surrounding myself by the same group of people and the same um, style of problems, then I don't, I didn't think I would be the type of professional coming out of my engineering degree as I would have wanted. I had a, I had a, I've always had a view for what I want to be, you know, when I grow up. Um, and that really keeps adapting based on what I'm doing and what I'm seeing around the world. And I, I guess I realized coming out of an engineering degree or coming out of that engineering degree, I wouldn't be at the position I wanted to by the end of it. That's the, that, that is the level of the truth. Yeah. The other truth was I had a lovely girlfriend at the time who volunteered under the sun and she was exceptional, bad breakup. And I said, you know what, if she can do it, I can do it too. <laughs> let's, let's see if there's something in this. Um, and what turned out to be a very, you know, strong aspect of my character for the next three years of my degree. Um, even as I became a professional, I kept volunteering for boards and for organizations. I think I'm still a part of, I've had some changes recently in my life, which um, has basically been, I've gone back to school. So I've gone and started my master's. I'm doing my JD consultant doing a law degree interesting different I'll, i can touch on that in a little bit but yeah uh, before that i we used to be on a board with monash health i'm on a board with oak tree um and they have always been various roles where i've wanted to give back my time in the way that i thought my experience would be valuable to both the people around me and the problem they're trying to solve incredible so you you now come back refreshed um, you know, you know, op, op, opportunistic view on life. You know, a bit more, a bit more, yep. ener- you know, a bit more energy. Um, um, and you start consulting. Well, no, sorry, you're in government now. So I'm in government. So did a, did a year with that, and during that time, I actually attended. There was an FYA conference, which the name of the actual conference escapes me. So Nexus. So they're um, around young entrepreneurs and social enterprises. So I went to this for a couple of days and one of the speakers there was a gentleman called Daniel Marvin, who is at the, who was at the time the CEO of Impact Investing Australia. Um, and I think now he's the CEO of Impact Investing Group. Uh, exceptional speaker, really down to earth and talked about for lack of a better term, solving the world differently with a new concept at the time, which was still forming. So if we take our minds back to 2015, the concept of impact investing was extremely new. Um, And for those who don't really understand what it is, impact investing, as I define it, is the ability to invest for not only a financial return, but also looking at what is the societal and environmental benefits through uh, financial mechanisms. Yeah. So, he spoke, I was really in love with the words that he was using. And after a couple of coffees, because we both uh, were able to interact quite nicely with one another, um, he basically said, why don't you come and spend some time with me before you go to IBM? At that point, I'd already got my IBM grad offer. So I knew I was always going to be leaving my, my policy role. Um, but he basically said, Tay, give me six months of your time. We'll have some fun. You may learn a couple of things and it'll be fantastic. So went directly from a social policy lens into a what was a financial policy, organizational development, um, small team of four people, uh, which grew to about six or seven by, by the time I left. Um, and it was a completely different lens. So going from government to social enterprise and not-for-profit, completely changed my paradigm on what else the environment exists, what else exists in the environment before I moved into the corporate world. Absolutely. But I'm assuming now that um, uh, given how long you've been at IBM, there must be some, you know, there's a bit of purpose there, a bit of, you know, you've been taking some of this in and injecting it into IBM. hundred percent. So with the clients that I've been able to work with through IBM and even the people who, work with me as my team or my peers or even other in other areas of the company the perspectives that i get to bring from a a government and a social policy lens sorry a government and a social enterprise lens still hold a lot of truth in some of the problems we're trying to solve so 
a lot of the nomenclature around innovation is that if you bring a diverse group of people into a room, you can have multiple perspectives and solve a problem differently. I still find that the lessons I've learned to date have been able to solidify that. But in IBM, considering where a services company and what that essentially means is a level of consulting and to do technology-based services for an organization, but we're also a very heavy technology research organization also, things change so very fast that by the time you get a grasp on something that becomes tangible, the next thing is coming along. And that next thing hasn't really considered 101 different perspectives because the pace of uh, change and growth is happening, um, which I've never been bored. I've never had a reason to look around at what else the world could offer because the company is so big. Um, and a lot of the work we do, I believe in the end goal that we're trying to achieve, which isn't only to try and perform a service and then go home. It's genuinely to try and make a difference in a number of different ways. Um, and again, it depends on the client and it depends on the type of work that we're doing. Yeah. And, and can, I, can I touch on that? Um, so I'm going to jump around a bit and then I want to get, you know, specifically into the, the innovation stuff, but you've got like, you know, it's your CV pretty much reads exactly what you've, what you've said, right? Is this, the, the <laughs> I <don't know> <laughs> yeah, yeah. The check, well, the check, yeah, exactly. You check out, man. Um, <laughs> but the, the idea that, um, you know, uh, you know, the digital changing so fast and, and so you've got analytics, AI, IOT, now, you know, innovation in cloud. Can you just talk a little bit about, you know, the journey in, in learning all these kind of interesting, you know, um, uh, new trends that are, you know, uh, well, cloud here to stay, obviously, you know, like, um, and then um, uh, how you, how you're processing that and then how you're, you know, staying ahead of, of, of that as a, as an innovator. So when I came into the company, um, and let me just take a step back, right? The, one of the main reasons why I wanted to join IBM at the time or why I accepted the offer was I wanted to be a consultant, so I ticked that box. But also, coming back to the volunteering conversation we had earlier, IBM had a, an opportunity for their best consultants. And I say best with a pinch of salt because they let me do it and clearly, you know, that uh, can go either way. But they have, they give an opportunity to a couple of consultants all around the world to be able to go to a developing area or to a, a smaller organization and offer consulting services pro bono to be able to do a project. Um, that to me was what I considered my test of have I learned how to be a good consultant to be able to solve a problem for something that really matters. Um, and 2018, I was sent to Morocco to work with a uh, an IT focused advocacy organization to try and encourage what is IT as a whole, both from an academic, a professional or a policy lens with their government work to get um, the Moroccan narrative to become stronger. Um, and that was exceptional. So when I mentioned earlier around IBM doing projects, which not only serve a techno technological growth or innovation lens, but also a societal lens, you do get those intersects at the best of times. Again, noting big co corporation have a very commercial lens to it. So sure, there's a lot of work which is financially driven, but where possible, the intertwines go and loop backwards. Um, when we look at what I've done through my role as a consultant, so again, as you touched on, I started in AI, sorry, I started in strategy and change, and then I moved into AI and analytics, and now I'm in cloud. And it seems a little bit backwards, but when I started, the projects that I was able to work on at the time were typically around change management. Um, and the work that I was doing was a lot of organizations were coming to us and saying, we want to update our and the RERP systems, we want to engage our customers better. We want to be able to have a 360 degree view of what our people are saying. Um, and I'm not a technical guy, but I also didn't really, by the time I was entering projects, the business case, the, the pitch for change, the, um, the strategy that they needed to follow was already written. 
So the next best thing for me to fit on was, all right, fine, you've got really good tech, you've got a really good strategy, what's that interim piece to try and actually get it to work? Because you can have the best ideas, but if nobody adopts it, then, you know, it's a good idea forgotten. So I spent a lot of my time in change. So working with change management, uh, learning and development, and trying to make that into interlock between the two different audiences, which slowly developed myself as a, as a, as a person who could speak the jargon on both sides. Um, looking forward when I looked at how change was working and how business strategy was working, because I never really had that aptitude to want to be a pure technical guy. I had the option to either go into AI and analytics or go into, I think there was a couple of other areas, but the reason why I jumped into AI was on one, it was the big buzzword at the time. Two, it was still widely not understood and not adopted by a lot of organizations, right? Because the moment you say AI, the, the fear instantly pops into your head, rightly or wrongly. You think of all of the cinematic versions of <laughs> Terminator, for lack of a better term. Yeah. Um, and I know we had to, as a company, globally, we had to spend a lot of time trying to re- reduce that paradigm. The way we define IBM, sorry, the way we define AI, especially within the company and to our clients, is that AI need not be something which will take over your environment. It's actually meant to be an enabler to increase human capability and capacity. So taking that lens, it was, again, doing the change management piece, but with a very interesting piece of tech where what is AI today and what can it be in tomorrow? Because really from a technology perspective, we were still figuring it out. We had a view, we were putting it forward in the form of um, cognitive chatbots at the time. And for those who don't really understand what that means, if you log into a, um, say a Vodafone or a Telstra or any other organization and you get that pop-up window, what we were able to do was ensure from a, a customer side that all of your questions could be answered. Now, whether that's a human at the end of the at the end of a computer answering your questions, or it's a what we call a, a chatbot or a cognitive chatbot who has the ability and has been trained to be able to answer all of your questions, it didn't really matter. So that intertwined piece, coming back to that changed lens, was where I spent a lot of time. A year ago, I came to the conclusion that AI is very cool. I'd spent a good year and a half, two years in in the space, but organizations weren't seeing the benefit of <clears throat> what AI can offer. Thinking that through a little bit further, maybe they were seeing the benefit, but they just couldn't unlock those benefits. So where, what were the blockers for them to be able to, that were preventing them from doing it? And where I looked a little bit further and coming back to my government lens, I've always had an, uh, an attachment to government, to healthcare. Um, and a lot of my clients at the time were in energy. So a lot of the government state owned utility organizations, I realized that maybe it's a little bit more, maybe we need to take one more step back. What is in their technical infrastructure? What is in their mainframe? What is in their ability to use cloud or ability to become faster as an organization, whether that's culture using agile or DevOps, or even just, again, coming back to that general change management lens that was stopping them. So that's why I found myself in cloud now because it comes back to what do we need to do now to be able to enable that level of innovation and growth at scale. Absolutely. So the, you couldn't get them on to uh, all the, uh, the exciting AI products and IoT without getting that in- infrastructure in place first, right? Short answer, 100%. Um, but I think the other lens to it is you get organizations who are able to pocket a pool of cash and a, a, a team of people who can work on something. They work on it, they make a proof of concept, they prove it, it works. In that excitement, it's very easy then for the executives of any organization to just jump in and say, well, let's make it real, blow it up and let's take it across the entire organization. But something that works in isolation does not work whenever you just assume it's gonna be a linear transition across multiple different users, different expertise, different areas, different priorities. Yeah, well, look, so this is a perfect segue to innovation, right? In the corporate innovation, yep. um, because this is often the case, you know, um, 
uh, the, the you know the story that kind of jumps out to me is um, you know Warwick Kramer who was a head of um, global innovation for Vodafone at the time saying you know that the the core business was getting you know upset about um, you know the cool guys in their office over there with their thongs on <laughs> you know, having all the fun. Um, how does how does innovation run at IBM? And how do you kind of balance the the need for speed, I, I guess, uh, versus you know, um, you know, the, how, how, you know, the core business and the core business objectives. So you can tell I'm becoming a good lawyer because I'm going to answer that with it depends. That's right. <laughs> at IBM, as individuals, we are <clears throat> we are encouraged and we are measured on what innovation we bring to our organization. Um, for me, because I don't necessarily sit on one client at any given point in time, it's, it's spread across what I do in my day to day for when once upon a time, when I used to spend a lot of time on a client site, um, it would be what innovations am I bringing into that client? Now, earlier I mentioned that it really depends on how we define innovation. And that to me is extremely important because innovation there's no one way to define it it's it's dependent on what are the goals of the organization what are the goals of you and your career or and the what is the objective you're trying to get out of it but also um what does the future really look like or what do you want to turn the future into innovation to some companies is a fancy product or a fancy new lens or the ability to do something faster. When I think about this as IBM's level of innovation, for a lot of the work that I did, it was around how do I change the business model in such a way that can become more efficient from a cost lens, but also enable the people around me or the, the services around me to do something more efficiently. So having that definition in my head made things extremely easy, especially when I was pitching certain opportunities or certain um, say improvements to products whereby I was able to say, this is innovative. I would instantly get challenged to say, well, how, what is innovative? What is innovative? We have been doing this for years, or this is something, this doesn't look cool. Or um, why are you showing me innovation in a PowerPoint slide? It's like, well, no, if you think about this, the innovation I'm trying to bring is you've never looked at this problem differently. This is a solution to that problem. And the innovation is how we apply it. So the actual process of getting from where we are today to where I think we can be, that is what I've considered innovation in that context. Um, so coming back to your question, how the organization has been putting that into action is if we look at it from a research lens, because IBM have a, bear, a very strong research capacity, um, and that's been proven through our ability to be, I think this is our 17th year in a row that we've had the most patents awarded to us in the world. Wow. And it's some ridiculous number of patents. It's some 700 and something. And that could be wrong, so don't quote me on that one. But I know that we've been leading it for a ridiculous amount of time. But for, for from a research lens, innovation has been pushing the boundaries of science using very complex technology and very complex thinking from a PhD level to try and solve a problem. Now those problems don't necessarily need to be commercially viable, but then for the ones that are, they typically get translated into a lot of the services that IBM are really proud of. If you take a lot of the blockchain work that we're promoting, especially with the food trust or what recently occurred in Australia around Ligon, so the banking collaboration, that once upon a time started from a research-based innovation that we've been able to understand and create a commercial pitch, which made sense to the right people at the time. How, how do you, how do you then like, you know, if I'm saying that you have this kind of global infrastructure at your, at your fingertips, mm -hmm. right. And you have, then you have a very specific kind of client problem that you're trying to, you know, unpack and then solve. Um, how do you how do you then access or know that you know shit we've got we've got a patent for this in in our operation in you know wherever um 
that I could, I could use that would be quite helpful um, at this point in time. How is that kind of um, getting fed down to you? That is one of the hardest problems we need to tackle on a daily basis. A company of 360 odd thousand people globally, um, we, at the best of times, I don't think it's easy to do a good job of this because it's unreasonable to assume that the idea somebody has in Australia is not an idea somebody has had 24 hours earlier in Latin America. Mm -hmm. I think this comes back to why when lockdown hit IBM or at least the IBM the IBM organization in Australia, at least were able to very quickly move everything to remote. We are very used to having the communication channels set up, um, the campaigns being run, and the level of conversation from partner level all the way down to graduate support staff, graduate or support staff level, to be able to say, these are the types of problems we're facing, um, what, what is happening in the world. Now, don't judge me, but I'll again say this, IBM have their own little version of Facebook, their own little version of what is Dropbox, um, and their own version of uh, say a file sharing mechanism, which puts all of our proposals, all of our thinking, all of our work that has either resonated or completely failed with clients. So oh, this market. is important, right? Yeah. Um, for us to be able to jump in and, you know, capture thinking. So somebody spending 30, 40, 50 hours on trying to scope out of to uh, scope out a topic coming back to how I was saying we are measured as individuals on what is our innovation, a measurement of that can be, have you put up X amount of proposals or thinking into that platform? And we right. call the platform Lighthouse. Um, so we've got this, oh, for a very long time, we've had this growing repository of all of this thinking, which has been developed, whereby for me, if my, so right, if I was doing a project with, what's a, if I was doing a project with Telstra, and Trelstra come to me to say, we know that you are looking at cloud. You used to have a history in AI. Um, what is an application that we can start looking into that may use those two lenses, but we also know that 5G is going to be a big thing in a couple of weeks. Has anyone started looking at it? If I put in 5G AI and cloud into Lighthouse, I may get up a Telefonica example of something that a Latin American conversation we're having or um, sorry, not Latin America, Brazil. Um, it is very reliant on the people base to want to share that knowledge. Otherwise, the rest of us are kind of stuffed. So when we look at innovation, the only reason why we're enabled to do it is because we don't only look at it from a top-down lens. We authentically believe that from a bottom-up one also. And is that, and then, is that then, you know, the, the the you know the the guy or girl in at you know that did the telephonica project are they accessible to you after that is it very collaborative in, in terms of yeah hundred percent so cool. when I put up a post so I I did a project recently for a water utility in Australia and it was around the predictive analytics of sending the right people to the right locations in a very geographically sparse area and how did we make that work? So how did we make it work from a technological perspective? And how did we compel our clients that it was the right thing to do? Now, if we take that a step back, the client at the time came to us and just said, how do we reduce costs with our maintenance stuff? So sure, we applied a technological lens to it, but also we have that technology at our disposal. So why not use it? Um, I was, I'm encouraged to put up that piece of, that piece of documentation or the PowerPoint slides onto, onto the lighthouse. But when I do it, it says, you know, I'm the one who's done it. These are the other people involved. This was the impact. This was the client. Um, so there's, it's a very robust mechanism for us to be able to make sure that the right people can be communicated to, um, or you know, what are the right questions to ask? That said, we're also a very big Slack organization. 
So if you wake up and you don't have at least six messages from Slack or six Slack messages from multiple different time zones, then something's wrong. Um, And then look, and then if I can move forward a little bit to to today and, you know, the the challenges of today, right? Um, So, um, you know, you talked about, you know, the ability to move quite quickly uh, and effectively remotely and Mm -hmm. you've got, have got the infrastructure there where you're always, it seems like working quite well and effectively on a global scale. Yeah. Were there still changes that need to be made because this is, you know, quite unique, you know, it's, it is definitely, definitely a little bit different than, than we've seen before. And everyone's got different um, levels of, you know, lockdown for lack of a better term. Um, what, what had to be, what was getting fed into, you know, um, become best practice with the, you know, the rapid change in each, each, geography so i tend to avoid the use of best practice and i know it's a very easy nomenclature to jump into but best practice for me is definitely not best practice for everyone else yeah um we we knew that good point we had faith that ibm is in general can move off to a remote world um and we also had faith in our organization to be able to support the individuals or families or areas that may have needed additional support, whether that's, um, you know, the compensation for internet or uh, office chairs, desks, uh, you know, ergonomic support um, or something as simple as, you know, let's give, or let's use the monitors that are on our desks in the IBM office and make sure that everyone else who needs a monitor can use one. Um, So there was that logistical support that was very quickly offered to everybody. Um, But at the same time, you have two different groups of people. There are the people like myself who are used to working behind a laptop because we move from point A to point B every second minute. So having a a place of residency wasn't an issue for us. For me, at least, if if I open up a little bit, Working from home has been great, but when I needed to start, although the lack of travel has been a nice change um, and coming from a guy who loves to travel, I'm surprised I'm saying that too, but I hadn't got, I hadn't set up anything in my home office. I've recently had to build this up from scratch. I never had a monitor. I never had a keyboard or a mouse because it's never been part of my need. I've been very happy sitting on a plane like this on my laptop working. Um, so there were, there were different groups of people that IBM had to account for, but also on top of all of that, our clients were, a lot of them were not ready for that transition. The, com, the purely commercial clients were able to make that transition because they didn't have, they didn't need to have to send people into their companies to be able to do certain jobs. But the downside for that was a lot of their infrastructure then was not able to manage this new load of people working from home using the network, connecting into the VPN. Um, So in some cases, they had to be very creative with how they balanced infrastructure load. On others, they had to, you know, create partnerships with technology providers and um, obtain hardware very quickly. What I mean by that is if I look at, we had a government client who needed to acts needed, um, sorry, we had a government client who were majority desktop users due to the way they worked. Getting all of their, all of their organization onto laptops was the problem they had. Um, they knew they had the VPN tokens, they had all of the infrastructure available. They just purely didn't have the hardware. Um, IBM at that point, I think, if from memory played a very big intermediary role to enable that hardware transition because we have a lot of technology. Um, IBM by policy don't make it a habit of ever giving our, so I can't give, once I stop using my Mac, my Mac will then go into a storeroom and it won't be used purely due to what information is stored onto it and what access provisions are there. The, I, the, the device itself will be recycled after a certain amount of time, but that device is not reused, especially on the client side. Um, so certain 
rules, certain policies, certain partnerships had to be created very quickly to enable organizations which are fundamental to Australia's, you know, not survival, but operations on a day to day to still be operable. Um, I think coming back to the question at hand, we had to be, we had to be flexible in how we approach this problem because as a people organization, we were pretty good going, taking our people off site. Um, but sh how we took certain clients who had different levels of virtual maturity across that journey was difficult because right. in some cases, again, we had very good, uh, we had very strong professionals who are adapt at virtual working who had been telling their clients for years, this is what you need to do. But it, it's like, it's like the, it's like the infographic. I don't know if you've seen that went up on LinkedIn consistently over this lockdown period where what is, what has been the biggest reason for digital transformation oh, yeah. CIO or CIO or COVID. Yep. Right? Interesting. And do you, do you think that this, you know, um, you know, trying to choose my words, but, um, um, is the, um, has this, it sounds as you're saying this, it kind of forced the innovation that needed to happen to happen at, at a, at a, at a greater speed, right? Like there's a lot of stuff that like, you know, we talk about the, you know, uh, uncovering business efficiencies or, you know, the improvement in process running a bit more lean, all this stuff kind of had to happen very fast. Um, which is probably beneficial to a lot of these businesses in the long run. So I'll throw the question back. Do you think they yeah. thought it was innovation as they were doing it? Probably not. It's probably more like necessity, right? Yeah. So yeah. if they defined innovation as the ability to survive on a day-to-day -day basis, then they would have called it innovation, but they weren't thinking about that. The, the problems, it's like Maslow's hierarchy. When, if you, if you look at Maslow's hierarchy, a lot of organizations tended to be in that middle tier. They weren't fighting for safety. They weren't fighting for their day to day. They were trying to achieve self attainment. As soon as lockdown happened, markets shifted, customers changed, how they engage with customers completely adapted. So you had to reinvent the wheel in 101 different ways. Um, and the gaps in what was keeping them afloat became much more apparent. So whilst there was a level of damage control on how do we keep the lights on, there was also a group of people or a group of organizations who we understand as the typically digital native ones who had started in the last say 10, 15 years who use data and use agile methodology and use digital platforms very effectively who were able to now redefine the market while the incumbents caught up. Yeah, crazy. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm writing it down, mate. You, <laughs> go. Um, and then it's just, you know, it's, it's really interesting because we had, um, you know, in my presentation, say the other day, um, I referred to a, you know, a matrix from McKinsey that had, um, and I'll, I'll get it up just so I've got to get it right. Um, Is it a two by two? It was the how to win and um, I'll find it. Um, sure. But um, the, uh, the concept that um, yeah, executing on current trends and they had how to win and the required capabilities. And I was just kind of laughing to myself thinking that like they're talking about the need to be agile, run sprints and stuff like that. Right. Yep. right. I was thinking, I, I don't see the McKinsey team doing standups of a morning at all. <laughs> am I wrong? I don't know. Am I, am I, am I, am I dated in my thinking? When McKinsey puts out a perspective, they need to be very conscious on who's reading it. Again, when I think McKinsey are renowned as the best strategic thinkers in the industry because of history, but also because of the culture they bring and the people they make sure um, go through their system. So I've got a lot of I've got a lot of friends in McKinsey, and I've got a lot of respect for the effort and the work that they put into a lot of their work. Um, they also realize that like any good consultant, sometimes you have to get your hands dirty to be able to do really good work. Um, I think it's, it's a misnomer when we perceive corporate strategy or high end strategy to only be the thinking and the PowerPoints and the, that's it. Sometimes you have to get into what is the process and actually spend a little bit of time there to be able to identify what the best options are. So, 
they may not spend weeks on end in a stand-up or they may not, um, they may not um, say fully integrate with organizations as they do that work. But I think they've spent enough time trying to understand the problem across a number of different industries where the perspectives they're putting onto that paper are due to that level of experience. So on one hand, I think there's a level of truth, but I also think the, the message gets diluted as it gets read by different audiences because of the perception we have of that brand and of those people. Yeah. Well, that's it. Perception, right? Cause I, I, for, for, for all I know that it's, it's, it's completely different, you know? Um, anyway, look, yeah, I don't want to get you in trouble with your mates there. And <laughs> oh, that's fine. But, but that's the beautiful thing, right? The things that you consider a logic mm. are completely out there thinking to other organizations. Um, and it's really, it's really a product of what that environment is. So it doesn't really matter if you were born a millennial or if you were, you had been in the industry for 150 years, if you're not exposed to that, then it's completely left of center thinking. And it could be to you, God's gift for, to humanity. I've got friends who I studied engineering with who, um, and one of them who I'm thinking about in particular, he works for, and he's worked for energy organizations. And he recently came to me to say, agile is the next best thing. And I was just like, well, <laughs> agile was the next best thing. And you and I studied together. So why don't you know this? It's like, <laughs> you know, I, 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 love, I love considering what, how has his process over the last five years been for him to now think that agile is the next best thing. When, if I look at my experience based on the environment I'm in, and even maybe it's an Australia context versus a European context, which I don't really agree with, but it's, it's a view. Um, how is somebody only now uncovering the word whereby I'm in a position where I'm certified over a couple of things. I've spent years in the area. I know the gaps and the, the shortfalls and I'm thinking about what's next. Yeah. Well, I mean, to, you know, to your, your point earlier, which I liked was like, you know, you know, about the, how do you define innovation and like what, what is innovation for someone may not be innovation for someone else. Right. I, I cause, because I, you know, I, as you're saying that, I'm guilty of saying this is how it's done, and um, and um, this is the most effective way. And you're an idiot if you don't believe it, kind of thing, right? Where it, it may very well not be the case. Um, so, can I? I, I want to um, jump on to um, you know the new bit of work you're doing here around COVID consulting. Can we jump in that for a little bit? Sure. I don't. Um, and I mean only for a little bit because I think we're leaving. I want to leave on the on a positive note, um, and maybe maybe it's still we can still do that. Um, okay. But um, what is happening? Like it, you know, you you've been you know um, put on this task force. If I if I got it right, to kind of look at um, how you can help companies. I think well, now that I'm saying that, we've we've talked a little bit about it, right? How can how can you help companies during this period? What has been exciting to you, and what has I guess again, trying to be positive, what has been, you know, pro what's been progress and um, yeah, how you, how, how you handling stuff. So I think without realizing it, you've already had me answer the question. So I'll repeat yeah. myself a little bit, but you know, that's fine, right? IBM's a huge organization with a lot of IP and a lot of really smart people, but with size comes the challenges in the actual organization of those people. What we did weeks so it came everyone will agree especially in the australia context that COVID came at a terrible time because we were still reeling over the pain of the bushfire crisis yes so we had as an organization we had just started to hit scale on our thinking of how we give back and how we can assist organizations and communities around support during the bushfire period whether that's giving our employees time to volunteer or whether that was actually going in and figuring out what do organizations need. And again, performing a level of consulting to support. That thinking took a period of time, which was mainly due to getting the right people in the room to be able to make the right decisions. I went on, so funny enough, I went on a cruise ship holiday for two weeks 
And then I came back into, don't laugh. I came back into the country a day before, I came back into Sydney two days before the Queen Mary. Yeah. And I came back into Melbourne uh, 24 hours before lockdown. I'm, so, I'm only laughing about the timing, right? That's I, I love it, right? Yeah. I was very well rested coming into this lockdown. Um, but as soon as that hit and things started becoming real because I was playing catch up, right? I was on a, I was on a ship with no internet for 10 days. So I had no idea what the toilet paper crisis was. I had no idea how crazy we were getting back home. Um, and it was, it was, it just hit me come coming back to the office on a Friday. Um, we knew that how we approached this had to be better than how we approached the bushfire crisis. Um, for two reasons. One, the, we still weren't 100% organized for to be able to offer, you know, qualitative, quantitative assistance. But two, if we weren't, then we would have failed our clients who need us to be better and need us to actually consult and lead them. Sure, we hadn't gone through a pandemic, but we're a group of smart people who should be able to figure it out. The group around COVID consulting, or the team that was formed, was we what we used what we call using IBM's garage method, which is a very big combination of design thinking, a big combination of agile methodology, a big combination of using virtual tools like Mural, Slack, and uh, Trello, to be able to get all of the ideas that had previously worked in an IBM context over the last twelve months, and questioned what is the most applicable to help our clients today, but how do we do it? a hundred percent faster than what we've ever done this can i can i please this is fantastic but i just want to jump it's almost like you went into start this this is like startup mode hundred percent okay we took a multidisciplinary team across every organizational business unit we gave them full autonomy and accountability to say go and fix it um let's worry less about the policies which stop you and tell us what is blocking you to be able to get client tangible results or opportunities out the door and what we found was the things that typically took us two weeks to do because it was getting the right people in the room and getting the right decisions across the board from a risk perspective or even just a solution holistic perspective we were doing it in less than eight hours incredible well incredible. it's nuts right because it's unconceivable that it takes us this long you can yeah. understand why but really well, that's good. You're uncovering your own inefficiency. <laughs> that's the one. Um, look, I, um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna end it there. Sure. Zubin, I could have talked talked to you with another, another, um, another hour. Um, <laughs> it was great fun. And um, yeah, look, I had, I had the sneaky text message, my, um, you know, a message to say, hey, I'm running late for the my eight fifty. But um, <laughs> thank you very much. Um, you know, really great conversation, and. Um, and yeah, so how, you know, as a bit of a call to action, you know, for, you know, um, do people just find you on LinkedIn? I'm going with the old Tim Ferriss style here. Um, do they find you on LinkedIn? LinkedIn's, uh, my, LinkedIn's my easiest. Um, go to. If you, if anyone wants to drop a note or connect, uh, please do. More than happy. Love it because, you know, it's, it's the world we live in. Um, I think the only thing I would challenge you in is don't connect for the sake of connecting. Try and see if there is actually something I can help you with or even just shape a perspective or have a chat. Um, you know, we all drink copious amounts of coffee because we're working 20 hours a day. So it doesn't need to be a coffee conversation. It can be as simple as just asking a question. Um, but if you have one or if you even just want to connect because you think I need a haircut and you're willing to offer me one, then <laughs> let's just go from there. Fantastic. Um, yeah, that's it. Be a bit more thoughtful with the with the outreach. It's not all about the numbers. It's not all about the numbers of followers. Um, thank you very much for your time, Zubin. You know, really enlightening. Thanks, and um, yeah, excited to have the chat. Perfect. Catch I appreciate you. it. See you, dude.